Hi, welcome to our first arrivals. Uh, I'm going to, uh, we're not going to start for a couple of minutes because it's going to take a little while for everyone to come in. But uh, if you can hear me, um, then your sound's working. If you're just looking at a, uh, a mouth talking and no sound coming out, you might need to fiddle with your sound. So we'll just leave it a minute or so. Okay, we're just going to leave it about another 30 seconds or so and we'll start as people are still coming into the room. Uh, and if you haven't got the chat box up, there's some guidance in the chat box about how this is all going to work for those of you who are here already and getting your screen organised in just the way you like it, which you probably know exactly how to do by this stage of, of life. <laughs> So is the chair doing a little bit of that herself, as you can probably see. Okay, I think we're probably um, uh, just about ready to start. I know that some people um, are um, uh, introducing <laughs> and putting questions in there already. Um, just a reminder that there's both a chat box uh, in which you are only able to con contact the, um, the moderators. Uh, there's also you want to look for the Q and A box, and that's where we'll be doing um, we'll be picking questions from in a little time while. But anyway, just to start uh, formally, uh, good evening everyone, and welcome to this, which is the first in our new series of Green Talks, where we're going to invite expert guests to talk about the important issues of our time, and where more important uh, than to start with. Uh, as I say often, those who follow me on social media, democracy. It would be a really good idea. And let's talk about how we can actually make the UK a democracy as it isn't now. So I'm Natalie Bennett, uh, one of the two Green members of the House of Lords. And you might think I'm sounding like I'm rather cock a hoop at the moment. That's because we de defeated the government effectively three times yesterday in the public order bill, which is mostly just making the bill slightly less bad. But we did also, um, the, the other side abandoned the vote because they had so few people voting for them. But we also brought in, and I think it should stick, um, uh, buffer zones around abortion clinics uh, in England, uh, which is a really significant gain um, and an awful lot of work and people put into that. So that was a real, real score. But anyway, what we've come together tonight to talk about is how we fix our broken electoral system. Uh, the majority of votes don't count. And it is worth focusing, I think, sometimes explaining to people that you know, if, if there's a, a, a seat where um, one party gets 60 or 70 percent of the vote, not only is it all the people who voted against uh, a person, and some people get elected with 25, 26% of the vote where most people vote against them, but even where someone gets a massive amount of vote, a huge amount of those votes for the winning candidate also don't have any impact. We need electoral reform now. Um, that's something that even Labour Party members, if not uh, yet Sir Keir Starmer, uh, agree with us on. Um, and I think it's really important to stress to people and keep this at its base really simple. Um, proportional representation makes it really easy for voters. Uh, under first past the post, a lot of them spend a lot of their time trying to guess how other people voted uh, are going to vote in their constituency and then adjust their vote accordingly. Uh, proportional representation, it's really simple. You vote for what you want and generally speaking, you get it. You don't have to guess how anyone else is going to vote. And I think stressing that simplicity is, I think, really important. In a moment, I'll introduce our panellists, but just a few housekeeping bits to uh, do first. Um, this is going to be split between a panel discussion and a QA, and and I'm determined to allow at least a good half hour of Q&A. You can put questions in the Q&A box. Um, that's the place, the only place we'll be taking questions from. Uh, and you can vote them uh, up in that box. So we'll be drawing, um, if we possibly can, from those who get the most votes, we'll also group them to try and pull them together. If you've got any technical questions, you can drop them in the chat box and our wonderful team of moderators, Julie and Charlotte, will sort out all of those out. Um, you'll only be able to contact the moderators in the chat box. So uh, looking at my screen and who I can see first, uh, I think we've got three people here who perhaps need no introduction in some ways, but I'll do that stuff anyway, because that's what you do. Uh, first of all, Jack, Zach Polanski, Deputy Leader of the Green Party. Zach, you can give us a wave. 
Okay, and Nate Higgins, a Green Party campaigner and councillor from East London. Hi, Nate. And finally, from Make Votes Matter, the cross-party campaign to introduce PR in the House of Commons in Westminster, we're joined by the co-founder and researcher, Owen Winter. Hi, Owen. And I'm going to tell some slightly embarrassing stories about Owen later, but you can, you can everyone can wait for those. But let's start from the beginning. Um, I'm going to, I, th I think we could, we could go on this for hours, but we're going to keep it really short and simple, snappily. What's the problem with our electoral system first past the post? Zach, over to you. Thank you, Natalie. Thanks very much for chairing and thank you for everything you're doing as well in the House of Lords. Thanks everyone for joining, uh, particularly all of our members and anyone who's not a member. I'm hoping by the end of tonight you might be a member, but we'll, we'll talk about that later. To answer the question, I think look at the state of politics. Just this week alone, we had Nadim Zahawi and then the scandal. Who was sent out to defend him? Dominic Raab, who himself is at the centre of a scandal. While Rishi Sunak has still not published his own tax returns, despite saying a year ago he would hope to have done it by Christmas. So I could spend all evening giving a litany of things that this Conservative government have done wrong over the past 13 years, but it would be a waste of time. I think most people on this call will recognise that we need a change of government. But then when we look at the opposition with Labour, it's not that they're completely wrong, but in many areas they're just not standing with the principal things we need. So if you look at something like immigration, for instance, too often because the Conservatives are so far to the right, Labour think they can just be a little bit not as bad as the Conservatives. So they're still not calling for things like safe routes to refugees, and they're still talking about things like tagging asylum seekers. When we look at things like standing up with striking workers uh, who are on the picket lines, the Green Party have been out with them. The Conservative Party are obviously nowhere near them. But again, the Labour Party want to be seen as a party of government rather than as a party that will stand in solidarity with vulnerable people in our society who are suffering from this government. So to keep it short, Natalie, as promised, I think when you look at the state of politics, you can see that a culture of safe seats where too often it's too difficult to get rid of a bad MP or an MP who can't be held accountable has led us to the state that we're in. So no matter what you care about, whether it's NHS, policing, the war in Ukraine, or the climate emergency, we need a system that is fair, where every vote counts, and we need to make votes matter. And for that, we need proportional representation. Thanks very much, Zach. And I think to summarise that is just look at our politics, the nature of our politics, the nature of our policies, both uh, Her Majesty's loyal opposition, His Majesty's loyal opposition uh, and, and our government. Um, and that's the case being put there. Nate, what would be your response to the question of what's the problem with our current electoral system? Thanks, Natalie. And, and thanks, Zach. I won't go over everything that you've just said because you've, you've done it so wonderfully, Zach. But I think one of the other really frustrating things about our electoral system is how it uh, poisons the entire system and the entire debate, everything from the media to the way that uh, debates happen in Parliament and in councils across this country, uh, to, to the way that parties operate. The electoral system really poisons the way that we think. Uh, it creates this us and them way of doing things. Um, and I know I'm a, I'm a Green Party councillor on a council that only has Green Party councillors and Labour councillors. And you would think, wow, that's a wonderful place to, to be, to, to work collaboratively. We have so many shared goals. Uh, and that's the way that I came into it. And, and unfortunately, that's just not the way that Labour behaves because they see us as the enemy um, be, because they, they, they don't understand that we agree on far more than we disagree on. Um, as 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 Joe Cox said, uh, that there is more that unites us than divides us, and and we'll go into you know the ways that we fix it. But when Labour say you know we haven't got time to campaign for changing the electoral system because we're too busy trying to get food on people's tables and people in school and people uh, a, a good job and all of those things, well, what we say is well actually the electoral system is what's stopping you doing that forever. Um, because as soon as, you know, you might win and be in power for one term, two terms, maybe even three terms, but then you'll lose and the Conservatives will just tear apart every single thing that you've, that you've achieved. Um, and we need to stop that cycle. Uh, and that starts with changing the electoral system. That's great. Thanks, Nate. And I do have to get in my regular advert here. I don't get any royalties for it, but there's a wonderful book by a professor called Z um, Stein Ringen, Nation of Devils. Uh, and it really sets out how 
the quality of governance under first past the post system is actually much worse. Um, uh, you know, ignoring even the ideological content. Um, so, from a, a non-party partisan perspective, Owen, what's your perspective on this? Yeah, I'm. I'm glad you uh, put that caveat in because I was going to say, <laughs> make votes matter is fully cross-party, and um, we've been really grateful of the support we've had from the Green Party, uh, including everyone on this call, uh, which has been really fantastic. But yeah, we are coming from this a kind of cross-party perspective. Um, I think the thing that really brought me originally to the campaign for electoral reform is just the kind of obvious unfairness of it. Um, seats in Parliament don't reflect how people voted. Uh, some parties win far more seats than they should really have, and some, like the Green Party historically, have won far fewer. Um, but what I've learned from being in the campaign for electoral reform is how that kind of um, disproportionality uh, warps every aspect of our politics. So I was kind of thinking as you were talking then, uh, Zach and Nate, uh, what was great about what you were saying is you've absolutely made the connection that the electoral system isn't just about fairness. Um, and it's not even just about democracy, although obviously democracy is very important. Uh, I think the electoral system, our current first past the post system, absolutely pollutes every single political decision that we make. Um, and that's why there's kind of decades of research showing that countries which, which use electoral systems like ours perform far worse on things like income inequality, on climate action, even on things like economic growth. Uh, so yeah, for me, it's it's firstly about democracy, but then it's about all the kind of bread and butter issues that people care about and how the electoral system uh, completely, I mean, it means politics just fails to deliver for the whole country. Thank you very much, Owen. And I did promise to tell the tale of Owen was 16 years old when he founded a petition which got hundreds of thousands of signatures. I've forgotten the, the, the number now. This was in 2015 after the least democratic uh, result in British history uh, when the Green Party got 1.1 uh, million votes uh, and still only one seat. Um, and uh, Owen said, make votes matter is utterly cross party. And attesting to that is the fact that the events that Owen created gave Nigel Farage the chance to photobomb Amelia Womack and I at the time. Uh, and it, the picture ended up in the mirror. And I still don't actually know why Nigel Farage photobombed us. But anyway, it's one of those moments of political history. Um, so I think, unsurprisingly, we've all agreed that first past the post is undemocratic. Um, the last uh, general election we had in the UK, uh, 2019, Boris Johnson, probably just about remember him. Is it three prime ministers back? It's hard to keep track, but I think it was three back. Um, he got 44% of the vote and 100% of the power in the Commons with a majority of 80. And one of the very strange things about the House of Lords is that it actually is more representative of the country for all its weird um, unrepresentativeness because uh, the Tories don't, and as we demonstrated last night, have the, the full control of the House, the crossbenchers, the non-party people actually hold the balance of power. So what's the alternative? And I think, Owen, you're probably the, the natural person to start on this one. What does Make Votes Matter see as the alternative? Yeah, sure. So kind of for the alternative, I think we just have to open our eyes and look around us. Um, the vast majority of countries around the world, democracies, use some form of proportional representation. Um, proportional representation is simple in its kind of principle. It is uh, if a party gets a certain amount of votes, they should get a kind of similar percentage of seats in parliament. Um, and that's how democracy works most places around the world. Uh, it's also how we elect uh, regional assemblies and parliaments in the UK, in London, uh, as Zach knows, and Scotland, Wales, and Northern Ireland. Um, so we kind of already know that PR can work. Uh, a lot of people kind of ask about, you know, what specific system do you want? So there's a few different ways of achieving proportional kind of outcomes. Um, but Make Votes Matter says that the kind of number one most important thing is that we scrap the current voting system and replace it with some form of PR. And there's, there's kind of whole range of different ways you can do that, which are tried and tested. Um, and what that does for politics is it means, firstly, it's more representative. So partly in terms of parties, but also in terms of 
um, gender balance. Countries with PR tend to have better representation of women uh, in terms of kind of other marginalized and minority groups tend to have better representation um, under PR. Uh, it also means uh, voters or people in general have more satisfaction with politics. So countries with PR tend to have uh, significantly higher satisfaction with politics. And also, as I kind of mentioned before, uh, it means that countries deliver uh, on a whole range of policy areas uh, much better than we do in the UK. So they tend to have faster action on climate change, tend to have lower inequality, tend to have higher growth, um, which, I mean, all of these things sound slightly far-fetched, but I think it makes a kind of intuitive sense. If you, if you design a political system um, that truly represents the whole country, empowers the majority of people, you're going to have political decisions that also are in those people's interests. So um, yeah, I don't want to go too much into the kind of nitty gritty nerdy stuff of systems, um, but the principle of proportionality is really tried and tested around the world. And thank you very much for that, Owen. Um, I not so much in these days, but in the in in my in a decade ago in politics, I often used to walk into a room and there'd be someone from the Electoral Reform Society going, "Well, we could have AMS or AV plus, but I think you know we should have STV." At which point, any audience other than an audience of total political nerds just sort of goes. Ugh. Um, and it's really not a way to win an argument. And speaking as someone who's a um, as you might say, a refugee from the AV referendum of 2011, when I stood on a lot of doorsteps going, it's not very good, but it's a little bit better than first past the post. Um, keeping it simple really has some strong arguments for it. So Zach, over to you um, in terms of how do you think, how does the Green Party campaign for PR? Yeah, I think this is a huge question. And as we reach for 50th anniversary of the Green Party, and I think Charlotte just helpfully put a link into the chat as well, how people can get involved with that. Uh, we know that there's no environmental justice without racial, social and economic justice too. And we're really clear that everything is connected, including democracy. And even the most diehard of Green Party members know we don't have a monopoly on good ideas. And actually, we should always be working with other parties. And we have a pluralist tradition. That means we both own our own ideas and values, but also we genuinely do listen to other parties. Now, Owen said I'm elected to the London Assembly, and that is elected by partly proportional representation. And I was elected under the proportional element. So to give an example, I chair the Environment Committee, which is a cross-party committee. So it means that any time I want to get something done or I want to convince London Mayor Sadiq Khan of anything, I need to get cross-party consensus. And I think that actually makes for better policy making and better scrutiny, because it means one party can't just dominate the conversation or run off without listening. But actually, you genuinely have to have conversations that move those arguments forward. So in terms of how do we campaign on this, I think the public are already there in terms of they're sick of seeing politicians argue. They look at prime minister's question time and they think that's a terrible way of doing politics. And we need to point to these good examples of where politics are done differently, including Scotland, where many people will know Greens are in government and also elected under proportional representation, various other places around Europe and the world, too. In fact, there's only one other European country that uses first pass for post, and that's Belarus, which is literally a corrupt dictatorship. Now, I know things are bad in the UK. We're probably not quite that bad yet. But I do think, joking aside, there is a serious point that actually first pass for post leads to this kind of autocratic decision making that doesn't include people. And as a Green Party, we believe in grassroots democracy. And I think, unsurprisingly, the public believe in democracy too. So I think what we really need to do to make the case is that if people want a more representative politics where everyone's voice is included and we move towards that environmental and social justice model, then we really need proportional representation. We need to make sure that whatever issue we're campaigning on, we always link to the fact that to get anything achieved, we need to change the democratic system. And then one final thing, if that's okay, which is cheeky because I said final thing twice. But it's really important to point out for the Green Party that even under the broken voting system, we are still winning. So this isn't just about self-interest, because actually we're proving in councils all across the country that we're now at 571 councils, I believe, at the last count. And we're showing we can win under the first pass for post system. The point is people shouldn't have to work that extra mile. There should be a fair system where every vote counts and everyone can win under the present system. But we need proportional representation. Thank you, Zach. You're definitely, for that point, allowed to say a uh, final time for the third time, uh, because it is really important to point out that we don't have to wait as the Green Party for first past the post. 
um, that wonderful graph that many people may have seen, I tweet it quite regularly with a number of councillors going up at an exponential rate. That's all done under first past the post. I don't think we include the Scots in that because they of course have a proportional council elections. Which brings me to Nate and we often, when we were talking about politics in this country, uh, other parties and mainstream political commentators assume that politics means Westminster. And one of the things we as Greens don't do and try very hard not to do is to acknowledge that you know lo politics must start with the local and those local decision making is crucially important. So Nate, how do you see PR from a, from a local council perspective? Thank you, uh, Natalie. It's a really great question. And I, uh, I really echo what Zach said as well about Greens winning under first past the post. Um, we, we broke through no amending 12 years of Labour one party rule under first past the post. I'm actually really proud. It, even if it were a proportional election, I would have won my seat. We we won over 50% of the vote in, in our ward. Um, uh, but but it just goes to show that Greens really can win under first past the post. And if you come away from this uh, webinar with any message, it's that one. It's that we're going to keep campaigning for PR, but, but we need to win under first past the post. But, but to answer your question, Natalie, um, I think it's really interesting that Every single time uh, the government has decided to devolve power from, from Westminster, they've decided to do it under a proportional system. So, you know, we've got the Northern Irish Assembly, we've got the Scottish Parliament, the Welsh Parliament, the Senate, and, and, and the London Assembly, all of these on proportional systems, all of them showing how well you can uh, work together and make decisions together and, and really implement policies for the better for everyone under proportional representation. But we've got our local councils, which haven't had significant reform for, for, for decades, that are stuck on this antiquated voting system. Um, and, and we see that on results, but we also see that on the, the, the powers that councils get given. Um, councils need so much more power in order to be able to deliver the results that residents expect. You, you hear people complaining about um, not being able to get the, the housing that they want or not being able to get their kids into the schools that they want or not being able to get the GP appointments that they want. And they expect their councillors, the, the people who are most closely connected to them. And we talk in the Green Party a lot about decisions being made as closely as possible to the people that that uh, are impacted by those decisions. But they expect us as councillors to be able to solve those problems, but we don't have the resources. Um, and so my argument is we need to give councils more power in order to be able to deliver the results that they want. But I don't want to just give more power to the same broken system and expect better results, right? Um, keeping making the same mistakes over and over again and expecting better results is, is, is literally madness. Um, so, uh, you know, in, in many ways, actually, first past the post, how it functions on the council level is worse than how it functions in, in Parliament. We have so many councils like Newham that still have 100% uh, or very close to 100% one party. And, and you bet that they're not getting anywhere near that in terms of the vote share. And it just, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm coming into Newham Council, I'm seeing how it all being one party for so long completely robs the council of ideas and uh, connection to residents. And um, it's, a, it's a really hard system to pull apart. We're, we're coming in and we're having to tell people that actually, no, you do, you do actually have to talk about these things publicly and in a, an accessible way and include uh, residents in those conversations. So, you know, Owen's here from Make Votes Matter campaigning amazingly for, for PR for, for Westminster, but we, we can't stop there. Um, we do have to uh, take the same uh, understanding and recognition that we have for, for the London Assembly and the Scottish Parliament that actually PR uh, empowers residents and, and apply it to, to our local councils as well. Thanks very much, Nate. And I, um, I think there's a really important point in there that tonight we're, fun we're focused on the electoral system and PR, but you wouldn't actually just change that and leave everything else the same the way it is now. Uh, but you, that's not just what we're talking about and the concentration of power and resources in Westminster. Many people don't realise that the UK is the most politically concentrated policy in Western Europe. And if you go to somewhere like um, France or Germany, local mayors, even of quite small rural areas, um, the states in Germany, 
have vastly more decision making power um, and they're not stuck as so many councils in the UK are now essentially only enough money to deliver their statutory responsibilities i.e. the, West, the, the um, what Westminster has said they have to do. Uh, so they're really acting like a gar arm of the Westminster government. And I think that's a really good illustration of there are many things wrong with our current system. Uh, PR is a, a big part of it, but not by any means all of it. So I think um, the question that sort of pops up at this point is just the inevitable one. And, oh, and I'm going to throw this one to you again. Why are we stuck where we are? You know, just a little question uh, for, for this stage of the evening. You know, why is the UK in, in political system in such a mess? Specifically, why do we have the current system? Owen, if you could start. Wow, yeah, tough one. Um, so, I mean, it's a kind of historical um, relic, I suppose, that uh, we fell into having a first past the post system. No one, no one ever really designed the British electoral system. It just came about through kind of gradual reform. Um, we came close to adopting PR in the kind of 1910s. Uh, but since then, um, basically MPs have tried to kind of cling on to the current system because they think it suits them. Obviously, if you're elected under a system, I think some of the questions in the comments uh, allude to this, you have a kind of stake in it. Um, continued existence. Uh, but I would say that things are changing. Um, support for the system is breaking down. We saw a poll recently come out, which had the highest support for PR ever. And I think that's a reflection of the fact that um, we've left behind so many of those kind of 18th century, uh, early, or sorry, 19th century, early 20th century political ideas about um, two parties and centralized government, as you're talking about, um, and the kind of binary political ideas. And we're moving into a, a political time where there's a lot of diversity among voters. Voters are more volatile than ever. They're shopping around for different kind of perspectives. Uh, there's cross-cutting issues, things like Brexit, whatever you think of it, it obviously cut across the kind of main political divides in 2016 or the uh, Scottish independence referendum did the same in Scotland. And what's happening is that the first past the post system, I think is kind of creaking at the seams uh, because it can't contain this kind of dynamic, diverse politics, which already exists in the UK. So I'm sure uh, some people will kind of roll their eyes and think how naive he is when they hear me say this, but I'm, I think um, first past the post, it's a matter of time really before it collapses under the kind of, weight of it, its own um yeah own dysfunction uh which i'm looking forward to um but yeah i think i think the fact that reform hasn't succeeded until now doesn't mean that um we can't win and there's so many signs that we're kind of getting closer to changing the voting system just like they did in new zealand and as they've done in other places around the world i really believe the future is pr um, and on that point, um, perhaps Owen, I can just ask you to just uh, a few sentences, just explain what's happened with the Labour Party and where it's at, because people may have seen the headline that said, oh, Labour's going to go to for PR, but um, it's kind of not that simple. Perhaps just a little explanation on that for those who don't know. Yeah, sure. So I was quite involved in the kind of Labour side of uh, PR campaigning. I was at conference, uh, Labour Party conference this year that voted for the PR motion. Um, Basically, what happened is that Labour Party members, uh, grassroots members, uh, massively after 2015 kind of came on board with the campaign and Make Votes Matter did a lot of outreach with them kind of early on. We realised that was a really fertile uh, place for support. Um, so we, along with other organisations, set up Labour for a New Democracy, who is, you know, completely Labour facing, made up of Labour Party members, Labour grassroots, and have been campaigning within the Labour Party. And what they did was basically at first went to practically every local branch of the Labour Party in the country and said, isn't PR such a good idea? And Labour Party members resoundingly said, yeah, that is a good idea. Um, so Labour Party members, really the ones who pushed it to conference. Uh, then there was a kind of a lot of work to win over the trade unions as well. So we've had some really big victories of the trade unions. Uh, big unions like Unite and Unison came on board and are now pro-PR. Uh, and that all sort of culminated um, in 2022 at the Labour Party, oh, yeah, 2022, I forgot what year it was, uh, Labour Party conference uh, where 
basically grassroots members and the trade unions uh, got together and passed a motion for PR. And uh, yes, passing a motion at Labour Party conference doesn't guarantee that it becomes party policy. Uh, so now it's kind of in this uh, nether zone. <laughs> uh, the policy making process in the Labour Party is very opaque, um, but it does kind of give us a, a strong uh, bargaining tool or a much stronger position within the Labour Party, particularly to talk to the leadership and MPs. So at the moment, um, Labour for a New Democracy is doing a lot of work, kind of trying to translate that grassroots support into support from politicians. Um, and I, I think I think things are moving um, a lot. So a lot of Labour MPs are now coming out in favour. They're kind of, I think for a long time, a lot of Labour MPs thought, well, maybe, but, you know, it's not an issue I hear about. Now they are definitely hearing about it from the membership and trade unions. So it's much harder for them to ignore it. So I don't know whether it will be in the next Labour Party manifesto, uh, but there's a lot of work going on within the Labour Party to try and get it in the manifesto. Um, so obviously... This audience is mostly Greens, which is great as well. Uh, but I hope you'll kind of be encouraging to your Labour Party friends and say, go out and get the party on board, because I think there is the opportunity there. And I think, thanks, Owen. And I think what we're doing here is um, the first question, which has been most upvoted that I can see at the moment, is from Mike Lloyd, which is how do we convince Tory and Labour MPs and voters to support a voting system when it potentially goes against them? And I think one of the things that I just add to what you, you've said, Owen, is in certain, certainly in terms of the Labour Party, I think there's a bit of a generational split. Generally speaking, it's mostly younger MPs who I've seen tend to be more pro-PR, and it's the older ones who are rather more set in their ways who tend to be more uh, anti-PR, and I can see Owen nodding there. Um, yeah, I was so just going to add to that that, I mean, we're, we're seeing in the Labour Party at the moment parliamentary selections for the next parliament, um, and the the new MP candidates in target seats, who obviously with the current situation have quite a good chance of being elected, are very pro PR. So I think things are moving. It may not feel as fast as we'd like, but definitely kind of things are in motion in the Labour Party. Thanks very much for that. And I, as I said, we're partly answering the uh, the question um, about how we influence people to do this. And Nate, I'm just going to come back to you briefly and just note that Lee in the chat noted that um, STV is now in Wales offered as a possibility. Now, I'm not going to ask you, Nate, to give a detailed commentary on Wales. You'll be pleased to hear. As I understand it, and I'm no expert on this, and Lee might like to actually leave um, a comment, could just leave a comment in the Q&A or anyone else who really knows more about Wales. But my understanding of the situation in Wales is that... Um, there is now the possibility for any local council to decide itself to switch to STV. Um, and so that's um, where things are now in Wales. Um, you know, how much progress that might be making in Wales, I'm afraid I don't have a, a detailed up-to-date knowledge on that. So anyone who does, please feel free to share a comment in the Q&A um, and that would be useful to share. But Nate, is this something you hear much talk about in um, local councils? You know, is it something that people are talking about if you go to, to events with councillors from different places? Is it on the agenda in your mind? Yeah, thank you, Nasley. And, and just on the Wales situation, that change has come out of the Labour Clyde Agreement in Wales, showing that when, you know, when people work together, it's infectious. They they want they want to bring that about in other places as well, and and newer and better ideas come out of that. And it's it's not the only electoral reform that's happening in Wales. They they're introducing um, uh, gender requirements and making it more proportional, which I think I think is fantastic and just shows the value of of working together. Um, and and we you know we saw a similar deal between um, Plaid and the Greens in in Cardiff and and other parts of Wales. Um, we, Wales is really showing how the different political parties can work together, both on uh, the, at the Senate and on the local level. Uh, and, and I think that's something for us all to learn from. Um, it's it's interesting. I was having a conversation with a, a Labour MP the other day about proportional representation. Um, and what they said to me is that they don't think Labour will, could ever do it from a position of weakness, which I thought was uh, in, like 
more revealing than they might have meant, actually. Because to, to them, in their mindset, changing the electoral system is a show of weakness, as, as in saying, well, we can't, we can't win as much as we'd like to under the current system, and therefore we'll change it. And it's, it's really hard when you're confronted with that, because it's such a, in my view, a broken mindset. Um, changing the electoral system would be a show of strength by the Labour Party, showing that actually we are willing to work with other parties. We aren't, we aren't going to hold on to the last uh, grasp of, of power that First Past the Post sometimes very rarely offers them. It's happened once in my lifetime, and I know I look young, but I'm not that young. Um, and so I, I, I think that Owen and, and others are doing really great work convincing Labour that actually it's not weakness to change the system. And, and there's there something else that I always found really strange, which is John McDonnell, longtime campaigner for, for electoral reform, was in the heart of Jeremy Corbyn's Labour leadership. But during that time, was saying very little about electoral reform. And he's since saying quite a lot, actually. And I don't want to attack him specifically because it's you know, he's he is saying the right things on electoral reform. But as soon as they got into the power structures of the Labour Party, the, they get silenced. And I, I found that really frustrating. And hearing Owen talk about the Labour policy process just makes me very glad to be in the Green Party, where when we pass a motion at conference, it happens. Um, what What's next on getting Labour to, to implement PR? So I think what we really need is at the next election, the Labour Party to depend on uh, support from, from the Green Party and also the Liberal Democrats and, and other parties in order to form a government. Uh, and we'll say, actually, the red line here is changing the electoral system um, because I don't, whatever they might say before an election, whatever the members say, I don't trust Labour to do it of their own accord. Uh, and so how do we make that happen? We show up in Bristol, we campaign there, we show up in in, in uh, Suffolk and we campaign there and we show up in Herefordshire and campaign there. Um, and of course we campaign to get uh, Caroline Lucas re-elected in Brighton to give, to give us the maximum bargaining chip that we can have to fight for a fairer voting system, fairer voting system after the next election. Because we have the absolute best chance that we've had in a long time and we can't, we can't give up this opportunity by, by giving Labour all of the cards. Well, thank you very much, Nate. And I think there's an important reminder in there that sometimes there's a people look at the polls now um, and, and sort of think it's all a done deal, but a poll is just a poll. And we do have huge opportunities in those seats, which I think we've slightly sold Zol and Zach's flood thunder here, but I was going to throw to Zach and sort of say, what can we do as Greens um, to campaign uh, right now? What's the best thing we can do from within the Green Party working as Greens? Um, to look towards getting PR. Thanks, Natalie. Um, I hope I'll spare your blushes, but I love the story of your first day at the House of Lords, which I'm sure you would agree is a hugely undemocratic organisation and massively needs reform, that you came to the first desk and you asked how you abolished your own job. And I think that's a really beautiful example and why I'm so proud to have you in the House of Lords of what a principled politician looks, sounds and acts like. And I think ultimately what we need is a House of Commons full of principled politicians. Um, to do that, though, we're going to need a fair voting system. So we're into a bit of a chicken and egg situation there. Now, there are Labour politicians that I think we should always shout out. So I've shared many a platform, for instance, with Nad Nadia Witteme, Zara Sultana, Clive Lewis, who are all pro-proportional representation and are progressive on other issues too. Of course, we have differences, but on this, they're absolutely right. So I think MPs like that and plus land, sorry, um, Labour for a New Democracy, Make Votes Matter, Get PR Done, all the work that's being done within the Labour movement, I think should be applauded. And we should recognise that the problem here is not with Labour members. We know that Labour members and trade unions have overwhelmingly supporting the principal position. The problem here is with Keir Starmer. And whilst I talk about pluralist politics, that doesn't mean letting people off when they make awful decisions or they make unprincipled decisions. We should be, frankly, furious with the state of where Keir Starmer is right now, that a whole party are wanting to move to a more positive position. And let's be very clear, he is the block here. 
Now, people within Labour sometimes say, just give it a few years. But we know in the Green Party, more than any other party, we have a climate crisis. We have an IPCC report, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, that says we only have just a couple of years left before we even need to reach the peak of emissions. We do not have time to wait to change the voting system. We need to treat this crisis like this is urgent, and that includes the democratic crisis. Now, the good news is, for the Green Party members, you are doing the right thing. I would encourage everyone to join the Green Party because we understand that crisis. And the more we grow as a movement, the more, A, that puts pressure on Labour to change their position or Keir Starmer. But more important, in and of itself, we are not there just to put pressure on Labour. We're there for our unique Green values and to see more Green councillors and more Green MPs. Now, we have some of the biggest elections coming up that we've ever had coming this May around the country in local elections. And obviously, one of the best things you can do is vote green but actually there's something you can do right now in many of those areas we will be running what's called target campaigns and there we already have green candidates but in lots of places because of a first pass for post system we know it's very difficult to win but we still want people to be able to vote green and to do that we need people to come forward to stand as non-target candidates so whether you know loads about our manifesto on very little at all if you have green values and you want to support environmental and social justice, then please do get in touch with your local party and suggest that you stand as a candidate. We know the biggest thing that can make people vote green in the future, particularly in national elections, that's for MP, is to vote green at a local election. So just having someone to vote for on the ballot paper is a huge step forward. So if you feel able to do that, please do get in touch with your local party and stand as a Green Party candidate. Now, just to finally answer in how you can uh, campaign for, for proportional representation, of course, joining Make Votes Matter and there's another organization, uh, Get PR Done. That's also a brilliant way of doing things. But actually, again, joining the Green Party is growing our movement. And you can join us at greenparty.org forward slash uh, join. That's greenparty.org forward slash join. I'm sure Charlotte will put it into the uh, chat now, but please do join the party. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much, Zach. And just to reinforce that point about um, joining the party and being a paper, being a candidate, even if you're only a paper candidate, what happens after every election, and I've seen this over many years, is I get lots of uh, people on my Twitter feed going, I wanted to vote green and I didn't have a candidate. And what I do with that is take a quick glance at their Twitter feed and provided they look at least halfway like it would be reasonable, say, well, maybe you could be the candidate next time because people sometimes think I think there's some great central organisation with huge numbers of people that move people around like a chessboard, but actually a local Green Party is a group of local people who get together and stand in their local community. You know, there's not some central office pulling the strings and organising everything, and that's you know how we started in Brighton and Hove, how we started in Norwich, how we started in Herefordshire, all of those things were local people getting started and doing it for themselves. And there's a bit more support now from central office than there used to be, but it still starts very much with that local. So we've only got about 15 minutes of um, our panel discussion before we're going to go to Q&A. So just a reminder to all of our participants uh, that the Q&A box is open. Uh, the top voted one at the moment has 36 votes. And of course, we're not Greens. We're not having a first past the post system here. Uh, there's still plenty of chances for people to get involved and engaged. But I think I might um, group two questions together and put it to each members of the panel, because I think they kind of oddly fit together. And Zach kind of mentioned this um, about the urgency of tackling the, the climate crisis. But um, I think perhaps we'll come to you first, Zach, in terms of how is PR going to help us tackle the climate crisis? And also, I think you might say the other side of this argument, and I'm sure anyone who's ever been in a meeting where they've argued for PR gets, but you're going to let the far right in. So we've got tackling the climate crisis and we've got letting the far right in. How do you tackle those things and demonstrate that PR takes us in the right directions? Zach, over to you. Yeah, I think they're definitely questions to lump together. So first of all, the facts stand with proportional representation. So when you look at countries that have proportional representation, on average, they have 18% less carbon emissions. Now, that's not just coincidence. That's because that's been consensual political decision making that means one person or a very small group of people haven't led the agenda. But actually, there's been genuine negotiation. And in negotiation, you're more likely to have green voices or voices that are looking at science and the facts and then making sensible decisions on that. I think one of the big worries um, about the climate crisis for me when you have a binary two-party system 
is that you might have one party, say the Conservatives, that are pretty much still in climate denial a lot of the time. But even when they're not in climate denial, they're in what I would call climate delay. Now, you would think that would mean the other party, uh, the main opposition, would then be very pro tackling the climate crisis. But actually, in a two party system, it means they can get away with just being a little bit less climate delay. So they still don't want to take the transformative change that we need. Uh, they don't want to do it now. They suggest that we might commission a report. We might do it in the next election cycle. And we just don't have time for that. Just as an adjunct to this as well, I think very often in the past, when we talk about the climate crisis, people talk about what we lose or we have to sacrifice. But it's always really important to point out that the transformational change that we need means things like cleaner air, better green jobs, more connected communities, more diversity within our politics, more diversity within voices that are heard. These are all positive outcomes. So actually tackling the climate crisis and creating a better society go hand in hand. And it's always important to point that out. Now, the flip side of that is people say, oh, but you might have a right wing voice or even a far right wing voice. So, look, I'd be devastated to see one or two MPs who are from the far right get elected to parliament. But quite frankly, if that represent what people want to vote for, then they should have that representation. And we've seen in the past, whether it's in council chambers or in the London Assembly, where two UKIP uh, assembly members got elected and then lost their seats in the next electoral cycle that disinfectant or sunlight, sorry, sunlight is the best disinfectant. We saw that when Nick Griffin got a spot on question time. He was given a panelist seat. It was not something I enjoyed. It was horrible to listen to. And frankly, for vulnerable people, it must have been terrifying. But actually, the BNP almost collapsed overnight after he was given that seat. When we give these people the seat and the representation, they so often show by the power of their debate that they don't have the facts, they don't have the science, and actually we need to get better at debating and better at presenting those facts, because ultimately the British public are in the right place. They've often been fed a diet of right wing and, and daily mail media, and we have a whole nother conversation to have there about how we tackle the media and media reform. But ultimately, when you get time with people, you can convince them and you can listen to them. So I think it's important that if people want representation, they should have that. And I think a big part of what happened in the Brexit debate is people felt for too long they hadn't been represented, that people weren't talking about immigration. Now, put aside the fact that the Daily Mail were talking about pretty much nothing but immigration and the BBC were platforming Nigel at every possible second. I think there was something important there that frequently in the Houses of Parliament, people felt like people weren't speaking up for them. And actually making sure that people are represented is vital to our politics. And that includes opinions that we might happen to disagree with. Thanks very much, Zach. And yes, I often um, make the claim that, uh, which I think is, is demonstrably true, that the slogan that um, won the, uh, the Brexiteers the referendum was take back control and people felt like they weren't in control of their own communities, their own lives, they weren't represented, their votes didn't count. And that was really a problem. So Owen, you must encounter both of these questions. Is there anything you particularly like to add um, to what Zach said? Yeah, I was going to say, Zach took all my lines because that was so good. Um, but I think, I mean, I might just add a little bit on the kind of research behind this. I am a researcher for Make Votes Matter. So I look at uh, kind of what academics are saying about the consequences of electoral reform and I think Zach hit a lot of the kind of most important things particularly there's a really good paper by a guy called Salomon Orellana about how diversity in your political system does tend to lead to better outcomes and he particularly looks at climate policy and how in New Zealand where they changed the voting system to a PR system uh, back in the 1990s uh, before electoral reform it was kind of two-party system, very similar to the UK's. Uh, they talked about issues that you might expect, like we do in the UK, and the change to PR, just by having more kind of uh, perspectives that could win election, changed the conversation, which then changed public opinion. So because climate issues were in the news, because uh, the Green Party in New Zealand were talking about them, it actually made voters much more respect, uh, receptive to uh, climate policies. Uh, another thing I was going to talk about is how um, first past the post really, I think, probably at the core of why it's so bad is that it it gives absolute power to a tiny minority of swing voters in a really small number of marginal seats. And because of this kind of it's it's much more about where your votes are than how many you get, um, which doesn't lend itself to climate policy. So each MP is just looking after their local area and they might have, you know, particularly um, 
emissions heavy industry in their constituency that employs a lot of people that they've got that on their mind um someone else might work somewhere with a coal plant and they're thinking about that when they're making their uh, votes in parliament and even if across the country most voters care about the climate and um, would benefit from climate action each individual MP is just thinking about how they can get those tiny minority of swing voters who are disproportionately likely not to care so much about climate issues and then the final thing on climate which I think is really key I think I've just drawn on myself and my pen because I got too excited, uh, is that um, policies under PR tend to be much more kind of embedded in the long term. Um, it's no good making climate policy, which is reversed a few years down the line. Um, and kind of whatever you think of the coalition, it's obviously clear that after Ed Davey, Liberal Democrat, uh, stopped being um, Secretary of State for Climate Change, a whole load of his policies were reversed uh, by the incoming Conservative Minister, uh, which means that like, there's no long-term planning in policy. There's no way we can deal with this crisis, which has been looming for decades, uh, because politicians will just swing one way or another each time there's an election. PR with coalitions uh, actually means that's much less likely to happen, so you can embed climate action in the long run. Um, I think Zach, I'm talking for way too long. I think Zach mostly got it on the far right. I was just going to say there's a, there's an important distinction, I think, um, when talking about kind of no platforming and the far right. Uh, the far right in the UK currently already have a platform. You already, I mean, uh, you, you see far right kind of messages um, on the news all of the time, on social media, they're extremely active. But what they don't have is any accountability because there's no elected MPs. So under PR, Yes, you might get a couple more kind of very right wing MPs, but at least in Parliament, they kind of have to abide by the same rules as ever, everyone else. Whereas out in the country, it's a free for all where there's no accountability and it's the kind of worst of all worlds where they have the platform without voters being able to kick them out. Uh, so that's why I think PR is, is the best way to deal with the far right. Thank you very much. And Nate, I'm, I'm wondering what you see, do you see the far right much in your, this is a genuine question I don't know the answer to, so I'm just throwing it to you. <laughs> uh, that's, a, that's a good question. Um, certainly not party political far right, the, the Newham, uh, between Labour and the Greens got something like 80% of the vote in Newham, so it's very um, voted fairly left wing. Um, but what we did see was um, uh, a lot of quite vicious and vile homophobic campaigning against some some candidates, and this is this is what we mean when we say that this country's electoral system doesn't make it as immune to first uh, to to the far right. First past the post is not an antidote to the far right. Um, but what it does do is it creates this uh, grievance politics where issues that aren't adopted by either the Labour Party or the Conservative Party sit and fester for years and years and years. And then the whole um, conspiracy theory of the government not uh, of politics not responding to it adds to it and feeds it. And ultimately, you end up with, in my view, something like Brexit. Um, I don't think it's a coincidence that it's in the UK where we have first past the post that that, that Brexit happened. Um, and if that, uh, you know, if the, the rising um, concern about the, the EU, um, lots of that was, was misdirected from rising concern about the government in the UK ignoring people. Um, but if that had been um, given a, a political outlet at an earlier stage, we might have, we might have been able to, to stop Brexit from happening. Um, but yeah, so the, the, the other big problem under First Past the Post with far right politics is it leaves us vulnerable to the far right taking over one of the two main political parties, which is what we've seen happen uh, uh, over the last few years uh, with the Conservative Party. Um, you know, we've seen uh, the, the, the bill that uh, Natalie and Jenny in the House of Lords have been working so hard to try and defeat the, the, the policing bill um, that would, would ban protest. Um, or, or will ban protest. And we've seen uh, protests against the, the monarchy having protesters be arrested. That, that, that is far right. Um, and we 
ha having a proportional system where these parties don't have this never ending grip on power is a really good accountability check against being able to take over political parties in order to uh, drive your own agenda. Um, but Zach said so much uh, on, on the, the far right point, so I'll leave it there. Thanks very much, Nate. And you picked up a point uh, made by Linda in the chat, noting we have a far right home secretary, which I think very few people would disagree with. Um, and I would say that we actually have a far right government. And um, I'm afraid the United States and other majoritarian two party system um, is you know, the most powerful demonstration of all. Donald Trump took over the Republican Party um, and you only have to take over the party to take over the country. Um, and, you know, there is no guarantee that Donald Trump or one of his acolytes um, you know, is a significant risk for the next election. OK, we've got a couple of minutes before we're going to go and pick up lots of Q&As from the Q&A box. So a final reminder to all of our participants that um, a chance to vote or sling your own absolutely brilliant question in and we'll get to as many as we can. What I'm going to do before that is to the panel, you know, the final big question. In 45 seconds, um, how do we speed this all up? You know, I, there was a, I, I can't find the comment in the chat now, but someone said they were 76 years old and they've been campaigning all of their adult life for PR. And, you know, it feels like a very long slog, I'm paraphrasing. Um, you know, and thank you very much to that person. So many people who've been working on this for so long. How do we speed this up in um, the next few years and get to where we need to get to? Um, Owen, perhaps if you start, 45 seconds, the answer. Yeah, so uh, I don't know how many people are kind of chat watching, but Charlotte just posted a really important, I was scrabbling to try and find the same thing, but there's a message in the chat uh, where it's got some of the key things from Make Votes Matter. In fact, I found it, so I'm going to resend it. Um, that's cheating and using my 45 seconds not to speak. But key bit is to join Make Votes Matter because we have a huge grassroots effort to change the voting system. Uh, we've got local groups across the country uh, pushing for PR. We've got an event coming up in May where we're going to do a mass lobby of parliament. Uh, so we'll get you know hundreds and hundreds of people, hopefully one of the biggest lobbies ever, to go and speak to as many MPs as possible and tell them that this matters. Um, we're building an alliance of politicians and the more people we have behind us, uh, the more kind of politicians will have to listen to us. So yeah, go and join Make Votes Matter. Check out the links I just posted in the chat uh, and come along to the lobby in May. Thanks very much, Owen. Zach? Uh, at the risk of being repetitive, I just want to amplify this lobby on the 24th of May. I went to one that Make Votes Matter did a few years ago, and then there was a remote one. And actually, these uh, lots of people there had no involvement with politics whatsoever. They might never have spoken to their uh, elected representative. And actually, I believe out on the Parliament Square, which is the grass just outside Parliament, people gathered into their constituencies, which is quite fun anyway, because people met from their local area. And then they went into Parliament and just politely asked to speak to their MP. Uh, lots of MPs didn't turn up, in which case they then sent them a letter afterwards. But actually, a good few did turn up. And I think uh, a lot of the people we would expect to turn up turned up. But then there were those people in the middle that uh, are ambivalent right now on this issue. And actually, it was a really good thing to do, because I think sometimes the power of being able to speak to your elected representative, look them in the eyes and ask them why they think your vote shouldn't count as much as anyone else's vote is a really powerful thing to do. So I'd encourage people to uh, go to that lobby on the 24th of May. And the second thing, it can never be too repetitive, but join the Green Party if you're not a member already. <laughs> Thanks, Zach. And um, uh, just to note that I've taken part in many great Make Votes Matter events over the years, uh, possibly one of the more extreme ones for reasons, there was some reason I've now forgotten, but we did a 24 hour fast at one point. And we all gathered together on the steps of Sheffield Town Hall in January. And of course, it was snowing. Uh, and there was actually one participant who I made a executive decision and said, you are going to eat something because you really look like you need to eat something. So, you know, you don't have to do that to go along to the lobby. All you need to do is take yourself along. Uh, and I think perhaps Make Both Matter might have decided no more fast, which was probably a good decision, I think. Nate, over to you. Um, what, 45 seconds, how do we speak this up? Thanks, Natalie. Um, I'm sure everyone would say, well, you would say that, but um, get involved with your, your local Green Party. See if you can get your council to pass a, a proportional representation motion. Um, 
I, the first thing that I did when I got elected as a councillor was propose uh, fair votes and votes of 16 motion at Newham Council. I had no idea if they would support that. Absolutely no idea. Um, uh, and it ended up passing unanimously. Um, and now the Labour MPs from from Newham in, in West Ham and East Ham know that the Labour councillors in that area are in support of proportional representation. Uh, and, and, and they all those councillors represent ward uh, parties uh, where their members will be will be expecting their MPs to, to to put that forward. And the more councils that are campaigning for for PR, the more we can show that actually this isn't just a you know a thing that people in political parties are obsessed with, but but something that the you know the actual uh, representatives of of people um, care about. And more and more in so many councils across the country, I, I forget the number that we have councillors on now, there is a green councillor who can put that forward. Uh, so speak to them if you have one in your area. If you don't, get involved. I, it, uh, from, from deciding that we were going to stand and uh, put candidates forward in, in Newham to, to winning our first two councillors was a year. So if you're, you know, if you've got elections in 2024, even if you've got elections in 2023, start thinking now. Can we get our first Green Councillors elected? Because I bet you can. Thanks very much. Um, OK, so we're going to try and I'm going to try and group a few of the questions and so we can get through as many people's questions as possible. Um, so um, it doesn't mean that everyone has to answer every question as we go around, but I'm just grouping some of these together. And we don't want to get too bogged down in discussion of systems, but I think there's some really important questions uh, and Steve C, indeed, with the top upvoted question at the moment, uh, points out that AV, alternative vote, which the 2011 referendum was on, uh, is not a proportional system. In fact, Australia has an AV, alternative vote uh, system. So what you do is you number one, two, three, four, five uh, down uh, your choice of candidates. Um, and that often produces actually less proportional results even than first past the post. So Steve C is asking, how do we decide on the version that works best for the UK, um, suggesting that we need to maintain a constituency link, but also having PR of the system? Um, we've also got a question. Um, David Hoare asks, what form of PR should be, we be recommending to be convincing? Uh, Paul Briley asks, what form of representation is PR is supported by the Green Party? Um, is a designated constituent MP relevant? Um, when many people are voting for a leader rather than individual MPs. So I think grouping all of those questions together and really saying, how do we explain this? Do we need to argue for it? How do we decide if we have an election where we haven't voted for it? Uh, and what's the Green Party position? Zach, I'll start with you. Thank you. So all of those questions can be answered with, with one phrase, really, which is the good systems agreement. Now, um, the Good Systems Agreement was an initiative by Make Those Matter working with other parties um, a good few years ago, which basically addressed how complicated all of these different systems are. And actually, it doesn't seem right that political parties, and certainly not individual politicians, should decide what system is the proportional system based on what is best for their party or even the one that they liked. So instead, they said, let's look at some criteria that any good system would have so things like proportional proportionality fairness a local link perhaps and all of these different different suggestions and then tabled what the different uh systems do and the idea is to get every party to sign up to the good systems agreement to say let's that let that be the start of the conversation and then we'll move on from there now as that conversation started uh, almost every opposition party signed up to it including a lot of the smaller uh, uh parties um, the Conservative Party did not sign up to it. Well, I don't think we'd ever expect them to. And sadly, the Labour Party didn't um, sign up to it. Now, I'm always really aware of not being too hard on Labour because, as I've said many times this evening, we are a pluralist party. So we believe in working with others and where people do the right thing, that should be applauded and we should work cooperatively. But that doesn't mean that we should be a doormat or we should allow undemocratic practices to go forward. And I think it's really important that people in the Labour Party know that Keir Starmer, again, has not signed up to a good systems agreement. Now, if you strip away a lot of what I just said, what is the principle there? Keir Starmer is refusing to say that he supports principles 
of a good democracy that are fair and that represent people. And I think it's important that there is pressure placed on Keir Starmer to sign that good systems agreement or to get involved with it. So in summary to the question, I don't think that should be up for individual people to decide. I think that should be for a cross-party approach to say, this is the system that we've agreed on cross-party and we will campaign for this at the next election. I think an interesting question is that Boris Johnson uh, just changed the voting system for places like the London uh, mayor back to first past the post without a referendum. He felt that that didn't need any more discussion and actually that could be changed. So there is precedent now actually to get on with this. Now, I think we should be cautious about that because actually we want to make sure that we have people on board with things. But ultimately, when you hear everything we've said tonight, first past the post is a broken voting system. We know it doesn't represent people and it shouldn't have been the status quo in the first place. So I think there's a very strong argument that if all parties go into an election supporting the same election system or a good systems agreement, when any party win a majority with that in their manifesto or the principle of supporting a good systems agreement, that shows we can then implement it because that would have implicit mandate from the public. And I think that's totally legitimate within a democracy. And ultimately, we've talked about the climate crisis. We've got to get on with things and we shouldn't be too distracted by other issues. And actually uh, supporting a good systems agreement is the way forward. Thanks very much, Zach. And um, I, I think one of the other things that um, we've seen real developments in is the idea of you have a uh, parliament elected uh, that has a PR majority and then you have a people's constitutional convention, a people's assembly to actually draw up what it might look like. Um, I'm not sure if that's actually make votes matter um, policy or not, but certainly it certainly, I think, um, lines up with the good systems agreement. And I also just, Owen, uh, we've, we've given you lots of praise and covered lots of make votes matter issues there. But just one final thing. I do have to note that um, there's a comment from a Lib Dem councillor who's joined us this evening uh, in the chat and welcome to that Lib Dem councillor. Uh, as Zach was just saying, we're a pluralist party and we look to work with others. We haven't really mentioned the Lib Dem. So, Owen, if you can just sort of mention how the Lib Dems fit in all of this and anything you'd like to add to what Zach said and perhaps what the, the Make Votes Matter position is on a People's Constitutional Convention. Thanks. Sure. Oh, uh, fun bunch of questions. Um, you might have to remind me of all, all of them, but um, I was, yeah, basically just so pleased to hear Zach mention the Good Systems Agreement because that is uh, Make Votes Matter's uh, kind of policy on systems. Uh, we recognise that there's some kind of really important debates there and uh, we don't want to just uh, avoid them, but we also recognize that if you start the conversation at the system, uh, people will just turn off. So what we've tried to do is kind of build a consensus around some of the key principles, as Zach was saying, um, and then we can kind of choose a system from there, depending on the political headwinds. And, and I think that's an important point as well. Uh, we are realistic. Uh, if we're going to change the voting system, it likely won't be because uh, the Prime Minister, whoever it is, invites Make Votes Matter in and says, you know, take your pick. It'll probably be the result of some kind of uh, agreement or, um, yeah, it, it will be a political process. And so we've got to kind of choose our moments with that. Uh, but the Good Systems Agreement is our starting point. Uh, we're also doing a kind of piece of work, or I've been working on this year, um, applying the Good Systems Agreement to some of the systems we see in the UK, uh, kind of setting out a little bit more clearly uh, what the parameters are, and we'll be publishing that later in the year. Um, on a kind of democratic, uh, did you say a People's Constitutional Convention, Natalie, was that? Yeah. Yes. Oh, yes. we're back. Um, yes. So, uh, Make Votes Matter, it does say in the Good Systems Agreement uh, that we'd ideally like a kind of democratic, uh, collaborative process to choose the system. Uh, we haven't set out what we think that should look like um, in detail, but, you know, a citizens' assembly is one way of doing that. And that's uh, happened in some countries which have considered... A I'm not sure if it's me that's frozen or Owen. I think it's Owen that's frozen. Okay. Yeah, it's me. It's my, it's my <laughs> Wi-Fi. That's, I, okay. I, 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 I better give you some space to um, uh, say something nice about the Lib Dems, uh, since we've got a Lib Dem kindly joining joining us. You might, yeah, I, I know there's lots of Lib Dem involvement in the um, Make Votes Matter. Perhaps you can yes. say something about that. 
we have lots of lovely friends in the Liberal Democrats uh, um, who has been very, very supportive. Uh, Democrats for electoral reform. Um, so they're kind of uh, similar to Labour for a New Democracy, grassroots Liberal Democrats who are pushing for PR. So we do a lot of work with them. And if you're a Lib Dem, I'd suggest kind of linking up with them because they do really important work as well. Okay, I'm aware, Nate, that we haven't come to you this time, but I think we might take some more questions and put that into, into the mix if we can. And I think there's quite a number of questions that take a kind of international perspective on this that I think um, brings up some interesting points. Um, so Ian Loddick um, uh, says that Italy, Belgium, uh, Switzerland and Germany all have different versions of democracy with more representation. And indeed, he mentions Australia, which is that certainly the case with the upper house, which is elected through a PR system but they don't always work in says better than our system. I'm not sure there's many working worse than ours at the moment, but certainly they don't all work perfectly. How can we avoid falling into their problems? Um, and Rod asks, is there an evidence base that shows people are more satisfied with the result of an election under PR um, and under first past the post? Um, and I think, um, oh yes, and also Richard asks about a criticism of PR is it suggested it creates unstable governments. Um, after the last 12 months we've had in the UK, I think we could probably say that around uh, first past the post. But in this case, Richard does point out an argument that's often made, call it the Morgan sim syndrome. Small parties can hold the balance of power and have an influence on policy way beyond the size of their vote. So the question there really is, is the international perspective, and Nate, we'll come to you first this time, what, from, from the local to the international, what's your perspective on, on any of those kind of international linked issues? Thanks, uh, Natalie. I, you know, I wouldn't, wouldn't necessarily say I'm a, an expert on, on uh, what's happening in those, those countries that, that have been mentioned, but I think it's important that we remember that while while we're campaigning for electoral reform and we really do think it will make a difference, systems are only as good as the, the people in them. And all systems are capable of producing bad results. Um, if there were a perfect system that, you know, would produce the, the exact right policies for the exact for, for every problem that could possibly come along, we wouldn't we wouldn't need elections, right? Um, we, we have elections because we have uh, people, um, all of which will have their flaws. And we put them before um, voters and voters make their decision. Um, and uh, w while saying that, it's also really important to remember that it, there are far more things than just the electoral system to, to what uh, impacts election outcomes. Zach mentioned the, the media and both me and Zach spend a lot of time talking about how the media in this country could, could do a lot better at covering um, elections and political parties and um, there, there are, there's also things like election funding. Do you have fair um, public funding of political parties that prevent uh, vested interests buying elections? And I, I know certainly in, in some of those countries that that, that might not be the case. Um, and so I think you need to look at the whole host of system reform, not just electoral reform to say how do we create a, a system that will that that is uh, set up and geared toward producing fair um, and equal outcomes. And then we say, well, actually, even within that world, there is a space for us to say, actually, we need as many Green Party people in there as possible, because we know that we act uh, as much as we possibly can in the interests of the people that elect us. We're willing to reach across to other political parties and, and work with people uh, who, wherever the ideas, the good ideas come from. Um, I'm sure um, Zach and Owen will have some more to say on, on those particular other countries. Zach, anything you'd like to say from that, what you know about the international perspective um, and where it's worked um, and where it hasn't? Yeah, so first of all, I think Nate's entirely right. It's, this is about a system. We've talked about the media. I think the most obvious example to give is that we have more councillors than UKIP ever had even at their peak, and Nigel Farage was never off for TV. So there's a real problem there about us having the due influence within the media. In terms of, it's often the eyes, Israel, Italy, Ireland, that, that often get uh, referenced as having unstable governments. Very often there's... Um, particularly local issues that are nothing to do with the voting system and actually there's evidence to suggest that if it was under first pass for post would be even more divided but i think there's a bigger point here where we talk about strong government 
I don't necessarily think we want big authoritarian strong governments that can't be kicked out or where you can't change who the government are. And I think we have a big piece of work in this country to do around coalition and the idea of coalition not being a dirty word. Uh, someone's written in the chat that they love Borgen and, and I love Borgen too. I think it probably appeals to most Green Party members because seeing that active negotiation and 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 um Di diplomacy live is really exciting now people say that that happens in back rooms and it's always smoke filled back rooms is always the, the criticism that's always used but actually that happens under first pass the post we saw that Nigel Farage and the reform party were doing all sorts of things uh before first uh, before the election at the last election to game it for the Tories whether they were going to stand to try and stop a Tory or not and in the end they ended up hijacking the government so we then end up with this strong government in terms of an 83 or 82 majority whatever it is now that is strong but actually it was already kind of tinkered with and the British public had nothing to do with that we saw Rishi Sunak elected without even having an election now I accept we don't have a presidential system but I think most people in this country would deem it unfair that a tiny minority a tiny tiny minority of people in this country decided who our prime minister was going to be as they rip up all sorts of things in our country like the protest laws or uh, like the policing bill without having a democratic mandate to do so um, and finally, yeah, exactly what Nate was saying around the system. Uh, just to give an example, uh, one of my first times questioning London Mayor Sadiq Khan, I advocated for citizens' assemblies around climate, so to bring Londoners' voices into City Hall. He said to me I needed to watch out that I wasn't in danger of making myself redundant as a politician. And this isn't to bash Sadiq Khan, he's not awful on lots of things, but I think that is revealing of a mentality around politics that is authoritarian, that is suggesting if we can just control things from the top down, everything will be okay. We know in the Green Party that our best solutions come from that grassroots movement and ultimately proportional representation would be a step to taking us there, but it's not like we get PR and we just stop campaigning. PR is just a step, a key to unlocking that door to a whole range of reforms that need to happen in our democracy, and it's always important to point that out. Thanks very much, uh, Zach and Nate. And I think what you were both saying is that um, proportional representation is a necessary condition to have democracy and a functioning politics, but it's not um, the solution to all of our problems. And in fact, from the chair, I'll say my piece of advice to um, anyone involved in politics is if anyone tells you, just do this one thing and it will solve all of our problems, uh, don't believe them and be a little bit suspicious of, of where they're coming from. Um, Owen, I know you've done a, a lot of academic work all around all of this. What, what's the main points you'd want to draw out from those international examples and the lessons we might learn from other places? Yeah, so um, as you kind of rightly said, uh, a country's political system is the product of a whole range of different um, issues. And I think probably those countries which have uh, really unstable, very fragmented political systems have in common is that they are... Uh, quite sort of unstable, fragmented um, uh, countries themselves. So Israel, for example, um, it's a, I mean, I don't want to go into Israel in particular, but it's a completely unique situation that Israel's in. And you can't just design a political system which will erase the fact that there's extreme diversity in ethnicity, religious views, um, and kind of history. Um, just as kind of looking from the first past the post perspective, India, for example, has one of the kind of most fragmented parliaments in the world. It has something crazy like 40 parliament, uh, 40 parties represented. And that is because India is a country which has a lot of diversity in terms of, um, like I was saying, religion, ethnicity, backgrounds, all of these sorts of things. So no, the political system isn't a uh, panacea um, and it can't be. But in countries which are kind of similar to the UK, which use PR, there isn't that kind of same level of instability. So I know I've, I've talked about New Zealand over and over, but New Zealand and the UK were on very similar kind of political trajectories. Um, New Zealand's political system was basically modelled off Westminster up until it changed its voting system to PR. Uh, and what's happened in New Zealand isn't a kind of... Uh, free-for-all, um, dozens of parties, fragmented government, uh, is kind of stayed broadly in a, a recognisably, um, a political system that we would recognise in the UK, where there's a kind of 
big Labour Party, a big centre-right party, and smaller parties which represent the breadth of New Zealand, uh, but also deliver very effective government. Um, and we've seen kind of Jacinda Ardern's Labour Party working with the Green Party uh, very successfully, um, and probably more stable government than they had before the introduction of PR. Um, there was also, uh, we almost missed it, but in your question, Natalie, about voter satisfaction, one of the things that I think is really interesting about that is that actually uh, voters for parties that aren't in government under PR systems are more satisfied. So even when, you're, even when your party doesn't get into government, if you can see them being fairly represented uh, under a proportional system, you're more likely to kind of get on board with the system as a whole, which goes back to our whole discussion about um, about the kind of far right and how if you just artificially kind of close people out of the political system, they will just uh, reject it entirely and they won't engage. If you have a proportional system, even when you aren't winning, you feel like you have a stake in the process and a kind of opportunity to shape politics, which I think is really important. Thanks very much, Owen. And we're just about out of time, but there's a question from Anne that I think I'm probably just gonna to put to Zach because um, I think it is a very important question that many Green Party members might be asking, which is the climate crisis is so urgent. Do we have time to campaign both for PR and on climate as well? Um, so you can walk and chew gum at the same time as they, they say in America and don't often get accused of using American sound bites. But I think the really important point is that um, we need to do both at the same time. And actually, we need to link these things together exactly as we have done tonight. So if we are going to, not if, we need to, when we challenge the climate crisis, when we tackle the climate emergency, we have to bring people on board. And that's what we call a just transition. That's the idea, for instance, if we're going to stop things like airport expansion in Bristol today, for instance, the uh, horrifically approved um, Bristol airport to be expanded. We know that ultimately we've got to move people into green jobs and we've got to make sure that there's green jobs out there for people. We can't do that to people. We need to do that with people. And to do that with people, they have to be democratically engaged within that conversation. So the climate crisis is going to require democratic engagement and proportional representation has to be at the heart of that. Thanks very much, Zach. And um, a question um, from a new member, David. Um, is the, the electorate ready to deal with this? You know, if you knock on doors very often, people will say, oh, you know, obviously cost of living crisis, energy prices, um, concern about how they're going to keep food on the table, the roof over their head. Um, Nate, what's your experience of knocking on doors? You know, do you bring up PR or is it more complicated than that? How do you, how do you raise the issue? Thanks, thanks, Natalie. Um, on, on this, voters are so far ahead of the political parties on this. You see this through poll after poll after poll. You've seen it through the, uh, is it the Brit British uh, electoral study? I, I forget the exact name of it, showing that voters um, want to change the electoral system. They, it, it's, not, it's not like Brexit, where until we, we held a referendum, it was, well, if you're going to, you know, if you're going to force the question on me, I, I have an opinion on this. Voters actively want to see a change. And, and you know, looking at the, the past few years and the results our system has produced, can you really blame them? Um, I think the I, uh, the first election I voted in was 2015, that general election. I think the, what are we on, seven years since then, seven and a half years since then have been the perfect example of why we need to change the, the voting system. Um, uh, to be honest, on, on the doorstep, voters tend not to bring up bring up issues. They're, they're more interested in, uh, you know, who you are and stuff. But um, on, on this issue, when you when you actually, you know, when they're asked the question, they're, they're way ahead of, of the political parties who think voters just don't care, which just is not the case at all. And that's interesting when we think about what we know about um, people's assembly type arrangements. The classic examples often cited are from Ireland where it turned out that in equal marriage and an abortion, the, the public were far, far ahead of, far braver than the politicians were. And that's an interesting case study. So Owen, I'm gonna give you the final word as the non-Green Party person on the panel. Uh, and I think the same question, You do you find that people raise this, I mean, obviously you'll make votes matter so people do, but how do you think you really get public engaged and involved in this? What would be your sort of one minute answer to that? Yeah, so, um... I think, you know, we can't claim that uh, people are talking about this every single day or they, you know, I would be, com I, <laughs> it, I would, yeah, I would look silly if I claimed that everyone thought about PR as much as I did. 
But um, I think what people do have a very strong sense of is how broken our political system is. Uh, we saw some polling from Ipsos recently, which had um, kind of standards for politicians was that biggest concern it had been in the entire history that Ipsos had been asking people what their main concerns were. So people do really care about kind of standards in politics and also whether politics is delivering. Um, I don't blame people at all for having kind of more immediate, uh, you know, the economy, cost of living, et cetera, as their kind of top ask. And that's why it's kind of up to us as campaigners to be making the link between those issues and the system as a whole. And when you do that, I think people are really receptive. Uh, so a nice thing that Make Votes Matter does is we do um, street stalls uh, where you actually do meet people who aren't super politically engaged. No offense to the audience. Um, and what people generally, they, they kind of say, oh, what like what's this all about? And at first, um, they're not immediately saying, oh yeah, PR, I love that. But once you get talking, I think people really intuitively understand that if you have a system that represents people, you're more likely to get better decision-making. Um, and so, yeah, and Clive Lewis, actually, I know he's come up on the call already. He has a fantastic way of talking about this, which I won't be able to emulate at all, but where he says uh, about how when people talk about those issues like the cost of living crisis uh, and how much kind of inequality there is in our country, they're talking about power. Uh, just because they don't say the words proportional representation doesn't mean there isn't a demand in the country for change. Uh, and I think PR has to be part of that. Thank you very much. And I think that's a perfect point to end on. And my response to that is always that if you went along and surveyed 100 people in the street and said, do you think politics is broken in the UK, uh, you would get about 99% agreement um, and the 100th would probably be a Tory MP. Um, so um, people do want change. They're not happy with how things are. And that I think is very clear, which is probably a very good point to finish on. Um, I think we've had a really brilliant evening this evening. Thank you very much to the many, many people who posted questions in the Q&A. Sorry if we didn't get to yours. We tried to round up as much as we possibly can. Thank you very much to Zach, Nate and Owen for being great panellists and being very good at sticking to time, which from the chair is always something to, uh, to make life a lot easier than having to interrupt on Zoom. Um, I think this has been a great evening. Um, really, it's very clear that replacing our current electoral system is a key Green Party policy and it's a policy that country needs. It strengthens our democracy and strengthens our rights as citizens. I do have to put a little advert in here. If you haven't seen this yet, this year is our 50th anniversary. That's a huge milestone for the Green Party. Uh, there's actually a political um, uh, theory that says that parties are born in one century and come to power in the next century. So it's pretty well just about our time. Um, and you can really help continue campaigning on this subject. There's been links in the chat to the 50th anniversary campaign. If you're a Green Party member or supporter, you'll see more emails about that. And that really is a landmark to celebrate, to get involved with, to do more things. As Zach has very reliably kept saying this evening, join the Green Party if you're not already a member. Um, get involved, stand in an election, make sure people have the chance to vote Green. I think this has been a great evening. Uh, as chair, I'm we're right on the time, so I'm going to try and end right on time. So thank you to everyone much who's participated. Thank you to Julie and Charlotte for making this all seamless behind the scenes. Uh, have a lovely evening. Thanks, everyone. Uh, yes, round of applause for everyone, particularly Julie and Charlotte. And I think that's where we're going to call it a night. Thanks very much, everyone.